I live in a quiet suburban neighborhood. My life is pretty normal. I'm an average student, and people say I'm responsible. Maybe that's because I don't get into trouble much. My parents are really strict. They always tell me about how dangerous the world can be. They like to keep me safe and cozy at home. But sometimes, I feel like I'm missing out. My friends always have these crazy stories about parties and adventures. They make it sound so exciting. So, one night, I decided to do something I've never done before. I decided to sneak out of the house. There was this rave happening in a field just outside of town. Everyone was talking about it. They said it was going to be amazing, with loud music and lots of people. I wanted to see what it was like. I wanted to feel that thrill. So, I waited until my parents were asleep. My heart was pounding as I climbed out of my bedroom window. It was the first time I'd ever done something like this. I met up with my friend Lisa, and we drove to the rave. I was nervous, but also excited. I had no idea what was waiting for me that night. I climbed out of my bedroom window, trying to make as little noise as possible. It was a mix of fear and excitement. I had never done anything like this before. My parents would freak out if they knew. But tonight, I didn't care. I met up with my friend Lisa, and we drove to the rave. It was in a secluded field surrounded by dense woods. When we got there, the music was so loud it made my chest vibrate. The area was packed with teenagers and young adults. The air was thick with the smell of alcohol and smoke. It was overwhelming and kind of scary. We joined the crowd, but I felt uneasy. I saw people taking drugs openly. Some of them looked way too young to be here. The carefree atmosphere started to feel wrong. This wasn't just fun and games. While we were dancing, I heard a commotion near the edge of the field. I turned and saw a fight break out between two groups. It got violent fast, with shouts and the sound of breaking glass. This wasn't what I had imagined. I grabbed Lisa's arm and pulled her away, trying to find a safer spot. As we moved through the crowd, I noticed a girl lying on the ground. She looked familiar. It was a girl from my school. She was pale and unresponsive. Even though I had never seen it, I knew right away. She had overdosed. I could feel panic rising inside me. The rave's chaos continued around us. Most people were oblivious or didn't care about the girl on the ground. I felt helpless and scared. This night was turning into a nightmare, and I didn't know how to fix it. I knelt beside the girl, shaking her shoulders and calling out to her. She didn't respond. My hands were trembling. Lisa pulled out her phone to call for help, but there was no signal. We were completely cut off. I shouted at the people around us trying to get their attention. She needs help, I yelled. But most of them were too drunk or high to understand. Some of them even laughed, thinking it was just part of the night's drama. It made me feel sick. Desperation mounting, I remembered the farmhouse we passed on the way to the rave. We need to get her to that farmhouse, I said to Lisa. She nodded, her face pale with fear. We tried to lift the girl, but she was heavier than she looked. As we struggled, a few partygoers noticed and started shouting at us to leave her and not ruin the party. One guy even tried to block our way, but we pushed past him. Every second felt like an eternity. Finally, we managed to get her up and started carrying her through the dark field. The music from the rave faded, replaced by the eerie sounds of the night. Every rustle and shadow creeped me out. It felt like eyes were watching us from the woods. The journey to the farmhouse seemed endless. The girl's condition was getting worse with every step we took. Her breathing was shallow, and she was cold to the touch. The fear of her dying in our arms pushed us to move faster, even though we were exhausted and scared out of our minds. Branches scratched our faces and arms as we stumbled through the woods. The darkness was suffocating, and I could barely see where we were going. I kept thinking about what would happen if we didn't make it in time. I couldn't let that happen. We had to save her. Finally, we saw the faint outline of the farmhouse. We were so close. We just had to hold on a little longer. We finally reached the farmhouse. I was out of breath, and my arms were aching, but we couldn't stop now. I pounded on the door with all my strength, 
praying someone would answer. The seconds felt like forever. At last, the door creaked open. An elderly couple stood there looking confused and worried. The old man had a flashlight, and the beam hit the girl's pale face. Please, we need help, I begged, my voice cracking. She's not breathing right. I think she's overdosed. The elderly couple quickly understood the seriousness of the situation. The woman stepped aside and motioned us inside. Bring her in quickly, she said. Her voice was calm, but urgent. We carried the girl into their living room and laid her on the couch. The man grabbed a phone and called someone. I heard him mention a local doctor. They were bypassing the police in an ambulance, knowing it would take too long to get here. The woman brought blankets and wrapped them around the girl, trying to warm her up. I watched, feeling helpless and terrified. Every second counted, and I was scared she might not make it. The old man put his hand on my shoulder. The doctor lives close by, he said. He'll be here soon. Lisa and I stood by, shaking and exhausted. I kept looking at the girl's face, hoping to see some sign of improvement. Her breathing was still shallow, and she looked so fragile. Minutes later, we heard a car pull up. The door burst open, and the doctor, a middle-aged man with a serious expression, rushed in. He had a medical bag with him. Without wasting a second, he started checking the girl's vital signs and administering treatment. We watched in silence as the doctor worked quickly. He gave her an injection and checked her pulse. Slowly, her breathing became steadier. The color began to return to her face. The elderly woman hugged me tightly. You did the right thing, bringing her here, she said softly. You might have saved her life. I nodded, too choked up to speak. All I could think about was how close she had come to dying. The doctor called an ambulance to come and take the girl to the hospital. After the ambulance left, the doctor offered to give Lisa and me a ride back to our car. We drove home in silence. The night's events had left us both speechless. As I climbed back into my bedroom window, the first light of dawn was starting to break. I was so tired but I couldn't sleep. I knew I couldn't keep this from my parents. They needed to know, and I needed to tell them. The next morning, I sat down with my mom and dad. They could see something was wrong right away. I took a deep breath and told them everything. I told them about sneaking out, the rave, the girl who overdosed, and how we had saved her life. My parents were shocked and upset, but they listened. They were glad I was safe and they were proud that Lisa and I had done the right thing in the end. I told them how the experience had made a huge impression on me. I had learned about the dangers of sneaking out and how important it is to be prepared for emergencies. From that day on, I understood why my parents worried so much. I promised them I would be more careful and make better choices. The terror of that night would stay with me forever, a reminder of how quickly things can go wrong and how important it is to be responsible. I'm a 22-year-old guy working as a pizza delivery driver in the city. I've been doing this job for about a year now to save up for college. It was a busy Friday night, and the streets were bustling with activity. The air was chilly, and the city lights reflected off the wet pavement from a recent rain. My shift was almost over when I received an order for delivery to a high-rise apartment downtown. The building looked normal, tall and sleek with shiny windows. I parked my car and grabbed the pizza box heading into the lobby. The place was quiet, with only the sound of the elevator dinging as it arrived. I stepped inside, feeling a bit tired but ready to finish my shift. As the elevator doors closed, I watched the lobby disappear, replaced by the numbers climbing on the display. I reached the specified floor and stepped out into a dimly lit hallway. The carpet was worn, and the air smelled faintly of something old and musty. I walked down the hall checking the numbers on the doors to find the right one. As I approached the door, I double-checked the room number to make sure I had it right. Suddenly, I heard noises inside the apartment, like things being bumped around. It sounded chaotic and strange. I knocked loudly and firmly on the door, feeling a bit uneasy. Everything inside went dead quiet. 
I called out, Hello? An aggressive male voice responded, Who's there? I replied, It's the pizza delivery guy. Another ten seconds went by, and finally the door opened, but only a little. A hand reached out, grabbed the box, and pulled it inside without opening the door any wider. It felt odd and suspicious. Just then, a female voice inside yelled, Please help me! He's hurting me! Call someone! Confused and not sure what to make of it, I took a step back and pulled out my phone to call for help. The guy inside dropped the pizza box and grabbed my arm, trying to pull me inside. I resisted, dropped my phone, and grabbed the top of the door frame with my other hand. I kicked the guy back into the room as hard as I could. He stumbled, letting go of my arm, and I took the chance to get away. I ran down the hallway, banging on every door as I passed. My heart was pounding, and I could hear the guy storming out of his room, coming after me. Each door I knocked on, I shouted for help, hoping someone would respond. The hallway felt endless, and the fear of being caught kept me moving. One by one, guests started coming out of their rooms, looking for the source of the aggressive knocking. I shouted for someone to call security or the police. The guy was getting closer, his footsteps echoing loudly in the narrow hall. But now there were more people in the hallway, and he started to slow down, realizing he was outnumbered. The guests quickly surrounded the guy, blocking his escape. He looked around, panic flashing in his eyes as he saw he was trapped. Some of the guests guarded the room where the woman was, making sure she couldn't get away either. We all waited, tense and anxious, until the police arrived. The cops stormed in, guns drawn, and ordered the man and woman to the ground. It turned out the woman had lured me there with the fake order to stage a scenario to get me into their room. She was in on it. The police cuffed them both and led them away, while I stood there, still shaking from the adrenaline. The guests who had helped me stayed until the police were done, making sure I was okay. The officers took my statement, and I finally began to calm down, knowing that I was safe. The police took both the man and the woman into custody. They searched the apartment and found disturbing evidence of their twisted plans. There were ropes, duct tape, and other items that made it clear they had something very bad in mind for me. The whole situation was horrifying. The officers told me that the man and woman confessed to previous crimes. They had lured other delivery drivers and even a few unsuspecting neighbors into their trap. It was clear they had some sick and twisted plans for me. I tried not to think too much about what could have happened if I hadn't escaped. The police stayed with me for a while, making sure I was okay before letting me leave. They praised me for my quick thinking and bravery, but I still felt shaken. The memory of the woman's desperate cry for help and the man's aggressive grip on my arm kept replaying in my mind. As I left the building, I noticed how dark and eerie the city felt. Every shadow seemed to hide a new danger. I got into my car and drove home, feeling a mix of relief and lingering fear. The headlights of passing cars seemed too bright, and the city noises felt louder than usual. I knew I would never forget this night. The thought of being the victim of such sick individuals was absolutely horrifying. I kept my pizza place job, but I asked to be scheduled for store shifts only. I couldn't do deliveries anymore after what happened. The experience had left me too traumatized. I kept my job at the pizza place but asked to be scheduled for store shifts only. I couldn't do deliveries anymore after what happened. The memory of that night still haunts me, and I feel a shiver of fear every time I think about it. I'm just grateful to have escaped and to be safe now. I often think about how things could have ended differently. The image of the man's hand grabbing my arm and the woman's fake cry for help still pops into my mind, especially at night. Even though I'm no longer doing deliveries, the experience changed how I see the world. I learned that dangers can lurk in the most unexpected places, and that being careful is not always enough. I'll never forget that night, and I hope I never have to face anything like it again. I was excited as we arrived at the summer fair. The fairgrounds were bustling with activity, and the air was filled with the smell of hot dogs and roasted nuts, and the sounds of cheerful music. Vibrant lights flashed everywhere, 
creating a festive atmosphere that was impossible to resist. I had just got my driver's license a couple of months ago, and me and my friends from school decided to take the one-hour trip to this annual fair together. We were all on the same ice hockey team, so we were used to spending time together, but this was a way to have some fun together in a totally different way. Once we got through the entrance gates, we immediately headed to the ticket booth to buy tickets for the rides. We joked and laughed, daring each other to try the scariest rides. As we made our way through the fairground, we bumped into Katie, a girl from school that my friend Matt had a huge crush on. Matt turned bright red and stammered a hello, while the rest of us tried not to laugh. Katie joined us for a few rides, and I could see Matt was both thrilled and nervous at the same time. We rode the Ferris wheel, the bumper cars, and even the spinning teacups, having the time of our lives. After a while, we decided to take a break and grab something to eat. We found a food stall selling hot dogs and lemonade, and we sat down at a picnic table to eat. The sun was setting, and the fairground lights were becoming even more vibrant against the darkening sky. Sitting down also gave us a chance to look around at all the rides and games we wanted to make sure to catch. We tossed out plates and cans in the garbage beside us and headed back into the crowds ready to have some more fun. I passed a game stall offering huge stuffed animals as prizes. A big fluffy bear caught my eye, and I knew I had to win it for my little sister. I could just imagine seeing her reaction if I came home with it. I was determined, so I stopped and started playing, completely engrossed in the game. The guys didn't want to hang around, so we decided to split up for a bit agreeing to meet back at the ferris wheel in an hour. Time seemed to fly by as I focused on hitting the targets. Unfortunately, there was another player that beat me every time. I finally gave up. I turned around and realized I was alone. My friends were nowhere to be seen. I had been so distracted by the game that I couldn't remember what we said about meeting back up again. I decided to look for them and started walking in the direction we had come from but everything looked different in the dark. The once cheerful music now sounded distant and eerie. The lights, which had seemed festive before, now cast strange, flickering shadows. I called out for my friends, but my voice was swallowed by the noise of the crowd. I wandered through the crowded pathways, but I kept ending up in unfamiliar areas. The fair seemed like a maze. My unease grew as I found myself in a less crowded, dimly lit part of the fairground. I was alone in a part of the fair that seemed almost deserted, and the sense of excitement had turned into a sense of dread. Then, I saw a man waving and walking over to me. He was tall, with a scruffy beard and a friendly smile. Hey there, you look a bit lost. Need some help finding someone? He asked in a calm, soothing voice. I work here so I know this place inside out. Just follow me and I'll get you back to the main fairground. Feeling instantly relieved, I told him about my friends and gladly followed him. But as we walked, something felt off. He wasn't wearing a uniform like the other fair workers. His clothes were plain and dirty, and he kept glancing around nervously. My gut told me something wasn't right, but I pushed the feeling aside, desperate to find my friends. My unease grew as I realized we are walking away from the crowds instead of towards them. Are you sure this is the right way? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. Trust me, kid, he replied, but there was a strange edge to his voice now. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I felt sure this was not in fact a helpful employee, but that his intentions were more sinister, and I decided to run. I turned to bolt back towards the main fairground, but the man was quicker. He grabbed my arm with terrifying force. I felt cold with panic as I struggled to break free. Where do you think you're going? He snarled, his friendly demeanor completely gone. His eyes were cold and menacing, and I felt a wave of pure terror. I fought with all my strength, kicking and twisting, trying to get away. My breath became short, frantic gasps. Finally, I managed to break free from his grip. Without looking back, I ran as fast as I could towards the lights and sounds of the main fairground. Help! Somebody help me! I screamed, my voice hoarse with fear. The dark, isolated area felt like a maze, but I kept running, driven by sheer terror. I could hear the man's footsteps behind me, but I pushed myself harder, 
my legs burning with the effort. Finally, I burst into the brightly lit, crowded part of the fair. I stumbled into a group of people, my breath coming in ragged gasps. Help me, please. There's a man. I started, but I couldn't finish the sentence. The fear and exhaustion overwhelmed me. A bunch of people rushed over, their concerned faces a welcome sight. The man who had been chasing me skidded to a halt, glaring at the group before disappearing into the shadows. I collapsed to my knees, shaking and gasping for breath. Are you okay? What happened? One of the fairgoers asked, helping me to my feet. Their presence was comforting, and I clung to the sense of safety they provided. There was a man. He tried to grab me. I stammered, my voice trembling. They looked around warily, but the man was nowhere to be seen. Stay with us. We'll get you to security, another fairgoer said, guiding me towards the main entrance of the fair. I felt a sense of relief wash over me as they stayed close, ensuring I was safe. When we reached the security booth, I explained what had happened, my voice still shaking with fear. The security personnel immediately alerted the fairgrounds management and called the police. They stayed with me, keeping an eye on the crowd. My friends, by now worried about me as I never showed at the Ferris wheel as discussed, rushed over to where all this commotion was going on. Their faces shocked when they saw me surrounded by fair security. I filled them in on what happened. Thank God you're okay. The police arrived about 20 minutes later and took my statement, and I was able to give them a clear description of the man. They said they may not be able to catch them, but at least they could put warning posters up around the fair with the man's picture. My friends and I were ready to go home. I didn't feel like driving, but none of my friends had their license yet, so I asked if they could keep my mind off of the events of the evening by talking to me about happy stuff the whole way home. As I lay in bed that night, nervous about telling my parents about the ordeal at breakfast, I thought about how a fun night at the fair had turned into a nightmare in just a few moments. I realized how vulnerable I had been, and the thought made me both scared and angry. The man had likely targeted me specifically, and that realization left me feeling exposed and distrustful of strangers. My parents were outraged and so supportive. As the days went by, they could see I found it hard to shake the lingering fear and made sure I saw someone about it. Crowded places now made me anxious, and I was always looking over my shoulder, wary of anyone who seemed even slightly suspicious. The once carefree joy of going to fairs and public events was now tinged with caution and unease. The incident had taught me a harsh lesson about the importance of being cautious and aware of my surroundings. I vowed to never let my guard down again, to always stay alert and cautious, no matter how safe a place might seem. In the end, the experience left a lasting mark on me. It took a long time for me to feel comfortable in crowded places again, and even longer to trust strangers. But it also made me stronger and more aware of the dangers that can lurk in unexpected places. Last summer, just after I finished my grade 11 school year, my safe little suburban life was turned upside down. My parents are pretty protective, always reminding me about the dangers outside our safe neighborhood. But I guess every teenager wants a bit of freedom, right? That's how I felt when I decided to sneak out one night to meet my new boyfriend, Jake. We had planned to meet at a diner 10 miles away. Before going to bed, I quietly placed my bicycle outside. I didn't want to risk opening the garage door and waking up my parents. Once they were asleep, I slipped out of the house and started my journey, taking a back road that ran along fields on one side and the neighborhood on the other. It was really dark, and the only light came from the occasional street lamp on the other side of the houses. The night was eerily silent, with just the sound of my bike tires on the gravel road and the occasional rustle of leaves in the wind. The fields on my left looked like a black sea, endless and empty, but I kept going just looking ahead of me, excited to see Jake and have an adventure of my own. Little did I know, this night would become a terrifying experience I'd never forget. I was halfway to the diner when I felt my front tire wobbling. I lost balance and almost fell. I steadied myself and stopped the bike. Using my phone's flashlight, 
I saw a piece of old, sun-faded glass stuck in the flat tire. Now I had a problem. I was exactly halfway, with five miles to go. The darkness around me seemed to grow thicker, and every little sound made me jumpy. I decided to keep going towards Jake instead of turning back. I tried calling him, but he didn't answer. So I sent him a text, explaining what happened, and that I was walking the rest of the way. I told him I was scared. As I walked, the silence was eerie. Every rustle of leaves and distant animal sound made my heart race. The fields on one side seemed to stretch forever into the darkness, and the houses on the other side were mostly dark, their residents fast asleep. About 30 minutes later, I was still walking when I heard a car coming from behind. Its headlights cut through the darkness, making my shadow stretch out long and thin in front of me. The car slowed down and stopped next to me. The driver, a middle-aged man with a friendly face, rolled down the window and asked if I needed a ride. At first, I felt relieved. Yes, please, I said, thinking how lucky I was. But as soon as I got in, something felt off. The man locked the doors with a click that sounded way too loud in the silence of the night. I felt my stomach do a flip. The man started driving, but instead of heading towards the diner, he took a turn that led in the opposite direction. The fear was real, but I told myself I have to pretend to stay calm. The darkness outside the car windows felt like it was closing in on me. I glanced at the man, his face now shadowed and unreadable. I realized I was trapped with a stranger, and I had no idea where he was taking me. In my best attempt to keep my voice calm and steady, I casually mentioned that he was going the wrong way. He ignored me, his face twisting into a sinister smile. It was clear that he meant to harm me. I looked to the right and subtly held my phone below the seat on my side and glanced at it. I saw several missed calls from Jake and my parents. My phone had been on silent so I didn't hear them. Panic set in as I understood they were worried about me, and for good reason. I subtly tried to drop a pin to Jake, hoping he would see it and do something. The man noticed me fiddling with my phone and slapped it out of my hand, swerving the car. My heart started beating uncontrollably. What do you think you are doing? He said in a low, menacing voice. Tears filled my eyes as I looked out the window, trying to think of a way to escape. The dark field seemed to stretch on forever, offering no hope of rescue. Just when I became overwhelmed with thoughts about what he might do to me, and that my stupid decision is going to mean that I will never see my family again. I saw headlights approaching fast from behind. The car's lights grew brighter and closer. The car drove up alongside the car. It was my dad. He forced us off the road. The man, cursing aggressively, realizing he had no choice, unlocked the doors and pushed me out before speeding away, leaving the car door still open. I stumbled out of the car and into my dad's arms, shaking and crying. He hugged me tightly, and I had never felt so safe in my life. The man's car disappeared into the darkness, and my dad tried to get the license plate number, but it was too dark to see. Jake had called my dad right after he got my text, and my dad used a phone tracker to find me. If it weren't for Jake and my dad, who knows what could have happened. I shudder to think about it. When we got home, my parents called the police. We reported the car and the man's description, but they never found him. The memory of his sinister smile and the way he slapped my phone out of my hand still haunts me. That night changed everything for me. My parents and I had a long talk. They were thankful to Jake for calling them, but they were also worried about the risk I had taken by sneaking out and that Jake would put me in that situation. I could see the fear in their eyes, and it made me feel guilty and ashamed. They told me I had a lot of growing up to do. They suggested I take a break from my relationship with Jake to seek counseling and rebuild trust with them. I agreed. I knew I needed to make things right and prove to them that I could be responsible. That night, I learned how dangerous the world can be and how important it is to make safe choices. It was a terrifying experience, but it brought me closer to my parents and taught me a lesson I'll never forget. Now. Every time I think about sneaking out or making a risky decision, I remember that night and the fear I felt. It's a reminder that safety always comes first.
I had been working the night shift for a food delivery service for a few months. As a 28-year-old bachelor named Jake, I had taken up the job to make some extra money to pay off student loans. It was a quiet Friday night in October. The air was cold and the streets were empty. The moon was high in the sky, giving just enough light to see the road ahead. I was about to finish my shift when I got an order for a late night delivery to an address on the edge of town. I swung by the restaurant the food was ordered from and picked up the order just as they were closing for the night. The delivery location was strange. An old farmhouse surrounded by thick woods, far from my usual deliveries. The address seemed familiar, but I couldn't remember why. As I drove through the narrow, curvy roads, I passed by a man walking beside the road who looked up at me as I drove by, and then went and stood in the middle of the road, his legs hip-width apart and his arms hanging by his sides, just watching me. I kept my eye on the rearview mirror and he just kept staring at me, standing there frozen, until I was so far down the road I could not see him anymore. It was so creepy, it made me feel super uncomfortable. Then, my GPS started losing signal. Tall trees lined the path, their branches making it hard to see the sky. The deeper I went, the more alone I felt. My car's headlights lit up the road, and soon I saw the farmhouse in the distance. It looked old, with paint peeling off and vines climbing up the walls. The only light came from a weak bulb above the porch. I parked and got out, noticing the heavy silence. There were no sounds, no insects, no wind in the trees, just a quiet that felt wrong. I walked up the creaky wooden steps, each one making a loud noise. As I reached the door, I heard faint music coming from inside the house. It was slow and sad, like an old song played on a broken piano. I felt uneasy. I knocked on the door, and after a few moments, it slowly opened. An elderly woman stood there, her face partly in the shadows. Her eyes looked strange as she smiled and asked me to bring the food inside and put it on the kitchen table. I tried to seem polite saying I don't want to bother anyone and would prefer just handing the food over. The old lady insisted saying she has hurt her arm and cannot put any weight on it. I stepped inside and the door slammed shut behind me. The house smelled damp and moldy. I turned around but the woman was gone and I heard soft footsteps from upstairs. I knew something was very wrong. I quickly set the food on the kitchen table and started to leave when I heard a whisper coming from the darkness at the top of the stairs. It was a deep, raspy voice that seemed to come from the shadows. You shouldn't have come here, it said. I froze, unsure of what to do next. I gathered my courage and bolted for the door, but it wouldn't move. It felt like it was locked from the outside. Panic hit me as I frantically searched for another way out. I found a back door leading to the yard, but just as I reached for the handle, I heard the same voice, closer this time. You'll never leave. I turned to see a shadowy figure coming down the stairs, moving unnaturally fast. Desperation took over, and I grabbed a heavy candlestick from the kitchen counter, ready to defend myself. The figure lunged at me, and I swung the candlestick with all my strength. The candlestick hit the figure with a loud thud, and it let out a horrible scream before collapsing to the floor. I didn't wait to see what happened next. I threw open the back door and ran into the dense woods, branches scratching my face and arms as I stumbled through the darkness. I could hear the figure behind me, its footsteps heavy and fast. My heart was pounding in my ears, and my breath came in short, panicked gasps. I didn't know where I was going, but I knew I had to get away. The trees were thick, and it was hard to see. I tripped over roots and stumbled through the underbrush, my fear driving me forward. The footsteps were getting closer, and I could hear the figure's ragged breathing. I spotted a small shed in the distance, its door slightly ajar. I sprinted towards it, hoping it would offer some kind of shelter. I slipped inside and closed the door as quietly as I could, pressing my back against it and trying to calm my breathing. Outside, the footsteps stopped. I listened, trying to hear any sound. The silence was heavy, and I felt a cold sweat break out on my forehead. Then, slowly, I heard the voice again, right outside the door. You can't hide from me, it whispered. I looked around the shed, 
my eyes searching for anything that could help me. I saw an old rusty shovel leaning against the wall. I grabbed it, my hands trembling. The door creaked as the figure started to push it open. I raised the shovel, ready to defend myself. The door slowly opened, and the figure stepped inside, its eyes glowing in the dark. Without thinking, I swung the shovel with all my might. It hit the figure, and it staggered back, but it didn't fall. I swung again, this time harder, and the figure let out another scream before collapsing to the ground. I didn't wait to see if it would get up again. I ran out of the shed and kept running, not stopping until I saw the faint lights of a house in the distance. I burst through the door of the house, startling the occupants. They listened to my story with wide eyes but didn't call the police. Instead, they told me that the farmhouse had been abandoned for years, and every now and then, strange things happened there. They offered to go and get my car for me. When they returned, they said the lights were off, and there was no one there when they arrived. I thanked them again for their help, telling them I had to get back home for one final delivery. I jumped into my car, trying my best to drive at a normal pace but speeding up as I got further away, just wanting to get the hell out of there. As soon as I had a signal again, I phoned my best friend, Mark. Luckily, he was still awake, gaming in his room. I asked if I could crash at his place because I was genuinely rattled by my experience and didn't want to be alone. He agreed right away and I felt a bit better knowing I wouldn't have to spend the night by myself. The next day, I called my work. I told them about the creepy farmhouse and recommended that the number and address of the final delivery be blocked or reported. Then, I gave my notice. I was totally traumatized and couldn't imagine continuing this job. It just wasn't worth it. The memory of that night still haunts me, a chilling reminder of the dangers that can lurk in the most unexpected places. Every time I pass by an old abandoned house or drive down a dark, lonely road, I feel a shiver of fear. I know I made the right choice to leave that job behind, but the eerie experience of that farmhouse will stay with me forever. I could hardly contain my excitement as we pulled into the dusty parking lot of the old fairgrounds. My friends and I have been coming to this summer fair every year since we graduated high school. It was our tradition, a way to reconnect and have some fun together. This year felt extra special because I had just finished my second year of college and I was ready for a night of thrills and laughter. But our experience that night would turn out to be more terrifying than thrilling. The fairground itself had an eerie vibe. It was held at the town's abandoned fairgrounds, which only added to its peculiar atmosphere. The rides were old and creaky. The lights on a lot of the rides were flickering or simply not on, suggesting bulbs were not being changed. I couldn't help but wonder what else may be neglected and not properly maintained. But I told myself there are check systems in place for this stuff and that I was just being paranoid. I reminded myself that we were there to have fun and share in the adventure of the evening and was able to shake it off. The smell of popcorn and cotton candy filled the air mixing with the distant sound of carnival music and the excited screams of other fairgoers. It was a strange mix of cheerful and creepy, but that's what made it so exciting. My friends and I made our way through the fair, laughing and chatting as we tried different games and rides. But my eyes kept drifting to the new attraction that everyone was talking about, the Midnight Ride. It was a massive roller coaster, towering over the rest of the fair, it promised the thrill of a lifetime, and I could feel my heart race just looking at it. I turned to my friends and suggested we try it out. They eagerly agreed, and we made our way to the line, not knowing that this ride would soon become the most horrifying experience of our lives. We joined the line for the midnight ride. I tried to hide the fact that I was as nervous as I was excited. As we got closer and closer to the front, I couldn't help but notice how old and worn the roller coaster looked. The metal tracks were rusty, and the whole structure seemed to groan and creak with every passing breeze. I was watching people's expressions as they turned through the air, trying to get an idea of just how scary the ride was. Everyone seemed to be loving it, and that made me feel better. When we finally reached the front of the line, I noticed the ride operator. He seemed distracted, barely paying attention to the riders. 
he was talking to his co-worker, laughing and joking around, instead of making sure everyone was safely seated. My friends and I exchanged uneasy glances, but we brushed it off. We were here for a thrill, after all. As we climbed into our seats, I struggled with my safety harness. It wouldn't lock properly. I started to feel nervous again, and I waved my hand to get the operator's attention. Excuse me, my harness isn't locking, I said, trying to keep my voice calm. He glanced at me, barely interested, and shrugged. It's fine, it's just an old ride. You'll be okay, he said casually, then turned back to his conversation. I didn't feel okay at all. I felt super uneasy as the ride jerked forward, starting to move before I could secure myself. I grabbed the sides of my seat, my knuckles turning white. The ride slowly climbed the first hill, the chains clanking loudly, and I felt like I was on the edge of a nightmare. As the roller coaster ascended higher and higher, I felt my harness loosen completely. I clung to the sides of the seat, my heart pounding in my chest. The wind whipped around me, and I could barely hear myself think over the noise of the ride and the distant screams of other riders. Each second felt like an eternity as we climbed towards the peak, my fear growing with every clank of the chains. As the ride picked up speed, my fear turned into sheer terror. The roller coaster zoomed down the first drop, and I felt myself slipping with each twist and turn. Still clinging to the sides of the seat for dear life, I desperately cried for help. I tried to stay calm, but every jolt and twist made it harder to hold on. My foot slipped, and I frantically wedged it against the side of the car, hoping it would help me stay in place. My hands were sweaty, and my muscles ached from the strain of gripping so tightly. Each sharp turn felt like it would throw me out of the ride, and I could barely breathe from the sheer panic. Just when I thought I couldn't hold on any longer, the roller coaster came to a sudden jarring stop at the highest point. The chains clanked and groaned, and I was left dangling, my grip weakening. I looked down and saw the terrifying view of the ground far below. The ride swayed slightly in the breeze, making it even harder to keep my hold. My friends, realizing what was happening, started shouting for the operator to stop the ride and help me. Suddenly, the roller coaster jolted again, but this time it wasn't moving forward. The ride operator had manually halted the ride. I felt my strength fading, and my fingers began to slip. Suddenly, amidst the chaos, I heard a voice calling out to me from the seat behind. A woman, another ride-goer, was shouting instructions. Hey, put your feet against the front bar. You can use it to support your weight, she yelled over the noise. Desperately, I looked down and saw the bar she was talking about. With trembling legs, I managed to reposition my feet against it. The strain on my arms lessened immediately, and I felt a tiny bit more secure. Her guidance gave me just enough stability to hold on a little longer as I waited for the rescue crew. That small bit of support felt like a lifeline, keeping me from completely losing hope. Minutes felt like hours as the emergency crews arrived. They moved quickly, climbing up to where I was stuck. One of the rescuers secured a harness around me, speaking in a calm and reassuring voice, but I could barely hear him over the pounding of my heart. As they carefully helped me out of the seat and onto a stable platform, I felt my legs trembling uncontrollably. When I finally touched solid ground, I collapsed into my friend's arms, my entire body shaking. I was physically unharmed, but the terror of the experience left me deeply shaken. The fairground noises felt distant, almost like they were part of another world. The ride operator looked pale and horrified, realizing the near disaster that had just occurred. My friends and I decided to leave the fair immediately. The excitement that had filled our hearts just hours before was now replaced with horror. As we walked away, the bright lights and cheerful music felt like a cruel joke, masking the danger that lurked within. Later, I learned that the Midnight Ride had a history of safety issues. These problems had been ignored by the fair's management in favor of profit. This revelation made me furious and deeply disappointed. I couldn't believe how close I had come to a tragic end because of their negligence. My friends and family suggested I pursue legal action against those responsible. I was so eager to put this nightmare behind me 
that I did not want to involve myself further. I did, however, feel a responsibility to do what I could to prevent this from happening to anyone else if it could be avoided. So I wrote a letter to the authorities, explaining my experience again, expressing my hope that there are consequences for those responsible for the neglect, and stating that although I do not wish to pursue the matter, I believe that standards and checks for these traveling fares should be revised. Reflecting on the incident, I realized the thin line between thrill and danger. The once exhilarating and carefree trips to the fair were now tainted with fear and caution. I developed a lasting fear of carnival rides and a new appreciation for the importance of safety regulations. The fair would never be the same for me. Each flickering light and each distant scream would forever remind me of how fragile life can be and how easily fun can turn into a nightmare. My friends and I run a YouTube channel where we explore haunted and abandoned places. It was a late, chilly night in our small town. The moon was hidden behind thick clouds, and it made eerie shadows on the streets. My friends and I had decided to check out the old, abandoned house on Elm Street. Everyone in town said it was haunted, and we wanted to see if we could capture something spooky on camera. The four of us agreed that we would all sneak out of our rooms and homes at 11 p.m., and meet at the 7-Eleven on Main Street and walk together from there. When we got to the house, it looked just as creepy as the stories had said. The house was huge and dark, with broken windows that looked like eyes staring at us. Weeds and vines had taken over the yard, wrapping around the rotting wooden fence. Graffiti covered the walls, and the front door hung open on rusty hinges. The place looked like it hadn't been touched in years, and it really was quite creepy even just to look at. We gathered our gear and pushed the creepy front door open. The inside of the house was even more unsettling. Dust hung in the air, making it hard to breathe. The floorboards creaked with every step, and the only light came from our flashlights. As we looked around, we saw old furniture covered in cobwebs and wallpaper peeling off the walls. The silence was deafening, broken only by the occasional drip of water from somewhere deep in the house. My friends and I decided to split up to cover more ground. I headed towards the basement, drawn by a strange feeling. The stairs leading down were narrow and steep, and each step groaned under my weight. As I descended, I could feel the temperature drop, and my breath turned to mist in the cold, damp air. When I reached the bottom, I shone my flashlight around and saw something that freaked me out fresh footprints in the dust. Someone had been here recently. This wasn't just an abandoned house. It was something much more dangerous. The realization that I might not be alone made me feel ice cold. I moved further into the basement. In the corner, I saw a makeshift table with fresh food on it. Nearby, there were dirty clothes scattered around and a bed made from old, worn blankets. The thought that someone might still be living here made me super uncomfortable. This wasn't just an abandoned house. It was a place someone called home, and I had just intruded. I had to get out, but the fear of what or who might be lurking in the shadows held me in place. Suddenly, I heard footsteps approaching the basement door. I looked around frantically for a place to hide and spotted an old, moldy bookshelf in the corner. I squeezed behind it, trying to make myself as small as possible. The basement door creaked open slowly, the sound echoing in the silent room. A man's shadow loomed on the wall, growing larger as he descended the stairs. My breath caught in my throat as he entered the basement, mumbling incoherently to himself. I could barely make out his words, but they sounded angry and paranoid. The man, clearly mentally unstable, started searching the basement for intruders. He stumbled upon my flashlight and picked it up, his face contorting in rage. Who's here? Who's trying to steal from me? He shouted, his voice filled with anger and fear. He began smashing items around the room in a fit of rage, throwing cans and clothes everywhere. The noise was deafening, and I could feel my heart pounding. Suddenly, the man's wild eyes locked onto mine. He had found me. There you are, he yelled, brandishing a rusted knife. You're a thief. You came here to steal from me. His eyes were wild with anger and paranoia. 
I tried to reason with him, my voice shaking. No, I'm not here to steal. I thought this place was abandoned. I'll leave, I swear. But my words only seemed to make him more agitated. Liar! He screamed. He grabbed me by the arm and dragged me across the basement, his grip tight and painful. He pushed me into a corner and slammed the door shut, locking it from the outside. I was trapped. My friends, hearing my screams, thought it was part of the prank at first. Alex, quit messing around, Jess called down from upstairs. But as my screams grew more desperate, they realized something was very wrong. They rushed to the basement door, but it was locked. Alex, are you okay? Ryan shouted, banging on the door. Inside the basement, I could hear them, but couldn't respond. The man was closing in on me, his knife glinting in the dim light. I grabbed an old pipe from the floor and swung it at him, trying to keep him at bay. He lunged at me, and we struggled. My friends pounded on the door, trying to break it open. I fought with everything I had, knowing my life depended on it. The struggle with the man seemed to go on forever. I swung the pipe wildly, trying to keep him at a distance, but he was relentless. Just as he lunged at me with the knife, the basement door burst open. My friends, using all their strength, had managed to break it down. Ryan and Jess tackled the man, knocking him to the ground. The knife clattered away, spinning across the floor. Emma found some old ropes in a corner, and together we tied the man up. He thrashed and shouted, his eyes still wild with paranoia, but we held him down until he was securely bound. My hands were shaking, and my heart was pounding so hard I thought it might burst out of my chest. We need to call the police, Ryan said, his voice steady but urgent. We knew our parents would find out that we snuck out, but this was going too far. Jess pulled out her phone and dialed 911, explaining the situation in a rush of words. I tried to calm myself, taking deep breaths. As we waited for the authorities to arrive, I couldn't help but glance at the man tied up on the floor. He was still muttering to himself, his eyes darting around the room. It was clear he was deeply disturbed, and I shuddered to think what might have happened if my friends hadn't broken in when they did. The sound of sirens finally pierced the night, and moments later, police officers flooded the basement. They quickly took control, checking on us and making sure we were unharmed before turning their attention to the man. They read him his rights and escorted him out of the house, his protests growing fainter as he was led away. One of the officers turned to us, his expression serious but kind. You kids did the right thing by calling us, he said. But you need to understand how dangerous these places can be. You were lucky this time. He commended us for our quick thinking, but also gave us a stern warning about the risks of exploring abandoned buildings. We felt grateful to leave the house shaken, but unharmed. As we reached the edge of town, I couldn't help but reflect on the experience. I had always loved the thrill of urban exploration, the excitement of discovering the unknown. But tonight had been a harsh reminder of how unpredictable and dangerous these adventures could be. I realized how close I had come to serious harm, and it scared me. Back at home, I reviewed the footage we had recorded. The video was no longer just an exciting adventure for our YouTube channel. It was a stark lesson in the reality of danger. Watching it, I made a decision. I needed to be more cautious in the future, to think twice before taking unnecessary risks. This experience had changed me, and I knew it was time to approach our explorations with a lot more care. As I closed my laptop and prepared for bed, I couldn't get the man's wild eyes out of my head in the cold basement air. This night would stay with me for a long time, a constant reminder to respect the unknown and the risks that come with it. I'd been working a nighttime food delivery job in the city for about a year to help pay off my student loans. It was a regular Thursday night, and the weather was clear and cool. The streets were quiet and I was looking forward to finishing my shift and heading home. I was almost done for the night when I got an order for delivery. The address seemed simple enough, just another place in the city. But in my tired state, I had been working 10 days straight, 
I accidentally put the wrong suffix on the street address. Instead of going to Elm Street, I ended up on Elm Avenue, a part of town I wasn't familiar with, without realizing it. As I drove deeper into the neighborhood, the atmosphere changed. The houses were run down, and the street lights were either dim or completely out. The air felt heavier, and an eerie silence hung in the air, broken only by the occasional distant sound of a dog barking or a siren wailing. I started to feel uneasy as I realized I was lost in a bad neighborhood. My GPS was glitching, showing strange errors, and my phone battery was dangerously low. I pulled over at a deserted intersection to check the address again, hoping I could figure out where I had gone wrong. The night was getting darker, and the feeling of being watched started to creep over me. As I drove through the neighborhood, the streets became darker and more deserted. The houses were run down, with broken windows and graffiti on the walls. There were no street lights, and the only light came from the occasional flicker of a dying porch light. My GPS started glitching, losing signal and showing errors. My phone battery was running low, and I knew I wouldn't have much time before it died completely. The uneasy feeling in my gut grew stronger as I realized I was lost in a bad neighborhood. I reached a deserted intersection and stopped to check the address again. The street was silent, and the only sound was the distant hum of the city far away. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed two shadowy figures approaching my car. They were moving fast, and I could see the glint of something metal in one of their hands. I fumbled with my phone, trying to get a signal. My hands were trembling, and I could barely focus on the screen. The figures reached my car and started banging on the windows, shouting at me to get out. I desperately tried to think of a way out. The pounding on the glass grew louder, and the car shook with each hit. Just then, a car sped through the intersection, its headlights cutting through the darkness and causing the figures to jump back. Seizing the opportunity, I floored the gas pedal and sped away, my hands shaking on the steering wheel. As I drove, the reality of what had just happened began to sink in. I glanced in the rearview mirror and saw the figures fading into the distance, but the fear held on to me. I had narrowly escaped a dangerous situation, and my mind was filled with thoughts of what could have happened if I hadn't gotten away. I drove for what felt like hours, trying to find my way out of the neighborhood. My phone had died, and I was running on instinct. The streets were all starting to look the same, and I felt completely disoriented. The adrenaline was wearing off, and the fear of being stranded in this place set in. Every turn seemed to lead me back to where I started, and the dark, empty streets made everything more terrifying. I finally saw a faint light in the distance and headed towards it, hoping it was a way out. As I got closer, I realized it was a small, run-down gas station. I felt relieved, but it was quickly replaced by dread when I saw that the gas station was closed and the lights were from a single flickering bulb above the door. The building looked abandoned. I parked my car and got out, realizing I had no choice but to walk. The nearest open gas station or any place with a phone had to be miles away. I started walking, every shadow and sound making me jump. With every step I felt like I was being watched. After what felt like an eternity of walking, I finally saw the bright lights of a 24-hour gas station. My legs were aching, and I was exhausted, but the sight of the gas station gave me a renewed burst of energy. I stumbled inside, my breath coming in ragged gasps. The harsh fluorescent lights were a stark contrast to the darkness outside. I approached the counter and asked the clerk if I could use the phone. He looked at me with concern, probably seeing how scared and disheveled I was. He handed me the phone, and I dialed my best friend Mark's number, my hands still shaking. I called my best friend Mark and explained what had happened. His voice was filled with shock and worry as he listened to my story. Stay there he said firmly. I'll come and get you right away. It felt so good knowing that help was on the way. While I waited, the gas station clerk, a kind older man, gave me a cup of coffee. You look like you could use this, he said with a concerned smile. I nodded gratefully and took a sip, feeling the warmth spread through my cold, trembling hands. 
He let me sit behind the counter, away from the glass windows and the unsettling darkness outside. Replaying the moment when the shadowy figures were banging on my car window in my head made my skin crawl. The eerie silence of the deserted streets, the flickering bulb of the closed gas station, and the long, lonely walk all played back like a nightmare I couldn't escape. Every small sound made me jump, and I kept glancing at the door, half expecting someone or something to come through. The gas station's fluorescent lights flickered slightly, adding to the unsettling atmosphere. The clerk tried to make small talk to keep me calm, but I was too on edge to focus on his words. Finally, I saw Mark's car pull up outside. I jumped up, nearly spilling my coffee, and rushed to the door. Mark hurried in, his face full of concern. Are you okay? He asked, pulling me into a quick hug. I nodded, feeling a bit of the tension ease out of my body. Let's get you home, he said, guiding me to his car. As we drove away, after letting me know he is glad I am safe, Mark joked, saying, Next time, double-check the address, kid. We both laughed, but I could still feel the fear lingering in the back of my mind. I couldn't help but glance back at the gas station, thinking things could have turned out so much worse. I knew I was safe now, but the memory of that night would stay with me for a long time. Now, whenever I head out for a delivery, I make sure to double-check the address not wanting to relive that terrifying experience ever again. Jake and I arrived at the large summer fair just as the sun was setting. The fairground was alive with colorful lights flashing everywhere, cheerful music blaring from every direction, and the excited chatter of fairgoers filling the air. The smell of roasted nuts, sugary cotton candy, and greasy hot dogs mingled together creating a deliciously inviting aroma. As a married couple in our 30s, leaving our kids with my parents to enjoy some old school fun was a real treat that made us feel young again. We were both thrilled to be there, ready to enjoy all the attractions and indulge in the fair food we loved. As we made our way through the bustling crowds, we marveled at the myriad of rides, game booths, and food stalls. The Ferris wheel towered above everything, its lights casting a glow over the fairground. The laughter and screams from the roller coaster added to the excitement. We decided to try a few games, our competitive spirits high, and laughed together as we failed miserably at winning any prizes. After a while, we decided to take a break and freshen up. Jake headed to the washroom, and I waited for him outside. As I waited, I noticed a man dressed as a fair security guard standing nearby. At first, I didn't think much of it, but something about him seemed off. He wasn't patrolling or helping anyone. Instead, he was just standing there, watching people intently. His eyes seemed to follow each fairgoer with a cold, calculating look. As I continued to watch him, I felt a growing sense of unease. When Jake came out of the washroom, I quickly pulled him aside. Jake, there's something weird about that security guard over there. I whispered, nodding towards the man who was still standing in the same spot, watching people with that unsettling gaze. Jake glanced over, his brow furrowing. You think he's up to something? I don't know, but he gives me the creeps, I replied. Let's keep an eye on him for a bit, just to be sure. Jake nodded, and we started walking away, trying to act casual. I could feel my heart pounding as we moved through the crowd. I glanced back and saw the man following us, his eyes locked on Jake. My stomach twisted with anxiety. We passed through a less crowded area of the fairground, the cheerful noises of the rides and games fading into the background. I could feel the man's presence getting closer, and my unease grew. Suddenly, I saw him reach out and snatch Jake's wallet from his back pocket. Hey! Jake shouted, spinning around to face the man. Give that back! The man tried to play it off as a mistake, holding up his hands innocently. Sorry, I must have bumped into you. Didn't mean to take anything, he said, but his eyes told a different story. They were cold and calculating, and I knew he was lying. Jake wasn't buying it either. He told the man that we are not stupid, and to give it back, stepping closer to him. The tension between them was palpable, 
and I could feel my heart racing. Suddenly the man shoved Jake hard, trying to make a run for it. Hey, stop him! Jake shouted as he regained his balance and took off after the man. Without thinking, I followed, shouting for help as I ran. We weaved through the crowd, dodging people and obstacles. The festive lights blurred around me as I focused on keeping up with Jake and the thief. The fair's cheerful music and laughter now felt distant and eerie, drowned out by the pounding of my heart and the sound of our footsteps. The chase led us to a secluded area near the back of the fairground, where the lights were dimmer and the crowds thinned out. The man ducked behind a ride, trying to lose us. Jake didn't hesitate, following him into the shadows. I was right behind them, my fear growing with each step. Jake caught up to the man, and they began to struggle. The thief was strong and desperate, and I could see the glint of a concealed weapon as he pulled it out. Jake, watch out, I screamed, rushing forward to help. In the chaos, the man shoved me hard, and I stumbled backward, falling into the path of a moving ride. The world seemed to slow down as I saw the ride's gears and machinery inches from my face. With a desperate roll, I managed to avoid it, feeling the rush of air as the ride sped past me. I lay on the ground, trembling and gasping for breath, realizing just how close I had come to serious injury. Jake and the man were still struggling, but my scream and the commotion had drawn the attention of fair security. They rushed in, pulling the man away from Jake and disarming him. The thief's cold eyes met mine one last time before they led him away, his expression still menacing and unrepentant. Fair security, drawn by the noise and commotion, arrived at the scene and quickly apprehended the man. I watched as they pinned him to the ground, my heart still pounding from the adrenaline. Jake rushed over to me, his face pale with worry. He helped me to my feet, and I brushed myself off, still feeling the rush of the near miss with the ride. The security guard stood the man up and led him away, keeping a firm grip on his arms. They communicated with their team, and soon the police arrived, their flashing red and blue lights adding to the surreal atmosphere. The fairground that had seemed so fun and lively just an hour ago now felt dark and dangerous. The police took statements from us and the security guards, piecing together what had happened. It turned out that the man had a long history of theft and had been infiltrating fairs by posing as a security guard. He would blend in with the crowd, looking for easy targets to steal from. Since we did not make it easy for him, his violent side came out. As we drove away from the fairground, the night's events replayed in my mind. What was supposed to be a night of fun had turned into a terrifying ordeal. I couldn't shake the image of the man's cold eyes and the feeling of being so close to danger. The excitement we had felt at the beginning of the night was now overshadowed by fear and unease. The realization that the man had been targeting us specifically made me feel vulnerable and angry. We had been so close to serious harm and it all happened so quickly. It was a reminder that danger can lurk in unexpected places, even in a seemingly safe and fun environment like a fair. The experience left me with a lingering fear of crowded places and a newfound distrust of strangers. I knew it would take a long time for me to feel comfortable in such environments again. I also realized the importance of being cautious and aware of my surroundings at all times. Jake and I made a silent promise to each other to always stay vigilant and look out for one another. Our once carefree trips to the fair would now be tinged with a sense of caution and vigilance. We would never forget the night we faced the masked menace, and the lessons we learned would stay with us forever.